Dragon's Dogma is simultaneously a frustrating game and one of my favorite games ever. For every missing piece, for every clearly cut corner or content, there's a moment of brilliance that captures a style of RPG that I thought would never see an evolution. And that conflict is reflected in the history behind the game itself. The story behind Dragon's Dogma is that of a very complicated set of circumstances. A studio looking to create something new. A creator looking to fulfill a decade-old vision. Technology and ability that couldn't match that ambition and influences and inspiration that go back many years. It's a game that due to these circumstances ended up being very unique, yet coming out at a time when it was constantly compared to its contemporaries. It's a studio's first attempt at an open world RPG at a time when those hadn't yet become the norm, but it wasn't chasing the same goals as others. It was instead a game looking to evolve on a trend set by RPGs of times gone by, but unifying many of those games' disparate elements with an open world, and pushing both combat and party mechanics to what they perceived as their natural evolution. Dragon's Dogma is what happens when you have a very creative and ambitious dungeon master that sets up a wonderful story and world. They had thought out so many different unique spells, items, and characters, and then they started running out of time and simply pulled all the monsters from the manual and didn't have the budget to build the sets. It's still the type of remarkable campaign where for many years to come, even if it might not be your favorite, it did some things so right and managed to create something truly unique that every other campaign you ever play will slightly miss that same DM. Both in this metaphor and in reality, it's a game that never managed to fulfill its vision. But what it had was so strong that it's difficult to compare. And so I believe it's time that I add my opinion onto the ever-growing list of retrospectives of this cult classic. So hi, I'm Mugthief. Join me in a very in-depth analysis of Capcom and Itsuno's no longer forgotten world of Dragon's Dogma. As always, you have timestamps for everything, but I will be covering the game by taking you with me throughout a playthrough in order to discuss each element as the game presents it. This is a game that truly merits discussion, and I am so excited to talk about it. The word dogma, like much language that comes from years ago, holds not one meaning but many. Throughout time, it came from its original meaning in Greek of that which seems true and would be used in many different contexts. From a word that inherently contained suspicion of truth, to one that described rules, that of doctrine, to one that came to describe an absolute, a blind belief in something being true, normally attached to faith. At times in history, a creed and a dogma could be interchangeable, a series of guidelines by which to live, but a dogma carries so much more weight and history behind it as a word. So does Dragon's Dogma, as a video game, use this word because of how much this word can convey even outside of context, or because dragon and dogma both start with the letter D and that makes it catchy? Well, I don't know, but dogmas in Japanese culture have a very interesting history as well, and the story of this game is not precisely light or easy. So, for the first time in my short history of making videos, I'm going to choose the pretentious option and imagine that the use of this word is intentional because the story we're about to venture into is one of faith, morality, deception, and yes, dogma, in all of its interpretations. It's also not a great story, but it is a very interesting premise, and it will clash with the gameplay at times and stuff like that, but I wanted to set it up beforehand, because there's quite a bit more to the story in this game than might appear on the surface or what others would have you believe, and it does have things that it wants to say. At the same time, it's also a game where you can climb on an ogre and stab it in the butt, or rain down meteors on your enemies, or throw rocks at people. This game is really cool. The opening to the game gives us a view of what is to come many, many hours later as it teaches the base mechanics of the game, and already there is much to talk about. In Dragon's Dogma, you play as your own created character known as the Arisen. You have with you Pawns, which is a party of three that accompany you on your journeys and aid you in all they can. What this translates to is a game where you will almost always have three NPC companions that will do their own thing. 
and their roles in gameplay and the story are something we will get into later. For now, the act of playing the game is already very unique. You have a standard health bar and a stamina bar, very similar to something like Monster Hunter in case you're familiar with it. Your regular attacks will not drain stamina, but most everything else will. You have your normal attack and your heavy attack, as well as the ability to sprint, jump, use up to six different skills, and grab, which is very unique to this game. At the time, people compared it to Shadow of the Colossus, as you can press the grab button and cling and climb onto enemies to target weak points, as well as grab objects in the environment, hold enemies, or even throw them. Your health also works differently to many games, as when you take damage, a portion of your health bar becomes grayed out, representing how much can be healed through magic, and the blacked out part requires healing items. And this is an rpg -ass RPG, a very classic RPG in many ways. Not only are its aesthetics very rooted in traditional Western fantasy, but it's a game with a world of magic and monsters, swords and sorcery, dragons and dogma. You will cast fireballs, smash swords on shields, delve dungeons, amass loot, and manage an inventory with encumbrance as you hoard healing items and crafting materials. But in a way that distinctly stands out from other games that attempt to translate the D&D and Ultima Underworld school of RPG. After the tutorial, we cut to the town of Casardas, a small fishing village and home to your character and everything turns sideways when the dragon appears. You stand opposed to it, defending your town, and then the dragon rips out your heart and makes it his own. But you're not dead, no. You're Arisen. The Arisen is a chosen one of sorts, made a kind of immortal by losing their heart but retaining their life. They do not age, they do not wither with time, but they can be felled in combat. You could use that one word from that movie where Leonardo DiCaprio fought that bear that one time, and they have no other objective than to defeat the dragon. And this is where you begin your adventure and our first big explanation. Vocations function as classes, and it's one of the first decisions you make. You start by choosing Fighter, your typical sword and shield, Mage, which is a mage, and Strider, which can use daggers and bows. As you complete quests and defeat enemies, not only do you level up and improve your stats, but you also rank up your vocation and acquire specific points to spend on vocations. As each of those vocations levels up, you get new skills and upgraded skills, as well as passive benefits, and those passive benefits are divided between core augments and general augments. Core augments affect that vocation and those tied to it, and augments can be equipped regardless of what vocation you are meaning there's an incentive to swap between vocations and level them up to unlock benefits that you can enjoy no matter what vocation you play as. But wait a minute, what do I mean with vocations tied to each other? Well, those three base vocations go into advanced vocations, a more specialized version of their originals, as well as hybrid vocations, which combine two base ones into a different combination of them. Additionally, the vocation that you have selected will decide how your stat growth is distributed when leveling. This means that depending on your end game setup, you might want to min-max your vocation selection for the best possible stats. I will be doing none of this. I'm just playing the game as I go for fun, which I found to be a much more interesting perspective from which to dissect and analyze games from. This is my fourth time playing through Dragon's Dogma, but it was my first time reaching the real true ending and doing the DLC in its entirety, and my first time playing in six years, and with the passage of time, now that I'm old, I've been gifted with the ability to forget. When I was younger, I basically retained every single piece of knowledge I ever gained, which also meant I never really rewatched movies or reread books and stuff like that. But now, I genuinely forget not just details, but larger parts of things, which means I get to re-experience a lot of things. It's one of the reasons that making these retrospectives is so fun to do, and I hope it allows me to bring a fresh view to the things I decide to talk about. Another self-imposed rule is that I don't use the DLC armor that comes with the currently for sale PC edition of the game that is slightly overpowered. Anyways, this time around I chose to be a strider, as I wanted to end up trying out most vocations, but specifically end up as a magic archer. Will I though? Only time will tell. As a fresh new arisen, you get to roam the town and start taking on different quests. As I walked around picking up quests and getting my bearings, 
This sweet old man named Adaro told me that there would always be a place for me in this town. So I did what any normal person would do and picked him up and threw him off a cliff. To my surprise, not only could I, but he was just gone. And if there's one thing I remember is that he was required for a quest line regarding some spooky woods and some witches. And I really like that quest line, but guess what? I'm not doing that anymore because my actions have consequences in this world. Except not really. You can just let time pass for long enough and he will respawn, but I wanted to roleplay a bit. So hey, he's gone. You can spend some time here doing different quests until you move on to the next big objective, which is to receive training as an Arisen. You walk out into the open world of Grancis and make way to an encampment. This introduction to the open world is very controlled. It's basically a not long hallway and it really feels like the game is still holding your hand carefully. But once you make your way to the encampment, you will go through some further tutorializing and then gather your party. Here you will make your pawn, those who exist only to serve the Arisen. You make your own pawn, but you round out your party from the Rift, a place that connects the multiverse of other Arisens and dragons who have their own pawns, and while humans can't cross the multiverse to other worlds, pawns can. This populates the world with pawns you can hire and switch out, normally from your friends, and if you lack friends or don't have enough friends, then it fills up with pawns from anyone. Your party composition matters, even at the start, and it matters even more later. Each vocation fills different roles. Without getting too ahead of myself, there are enemies weak to magic, enemies weak to physical damage, and each vocation, even the starting ones, have a very good reason to exist within a party. A mage is almost always mandatory, as they're the only ones who can heal, and while sorcerers are mainly damage dealers, they also have access to spells that don't heal, but can cure status effects, including fatal ones like petrification. Fighters are the best at tanking damage with their shields, followed by mystic knights. And while warriors are very tanky, they can't force enemies to target them to the same degree as a fighter. When it comes to striders, rangers, and magic archers, they all trade on flexibility, while theoretically not excelling at anything. They have access to range and melee, and in the case of magic archers, magic range and physical melee, with the remaining assassin class being designed as a nimbler warrior, which comes with augments designed for solo play. Each vocation has a role, a part to play, and they play well off each other in parties, with different skills synergizing and helping each other, while still being flashy and fun to play as if you chose to do so. Whether you're specializing on a role or you simply want to collect different augments and passives from each one, to create a perfect character, it always feels good to join in on a new role and play through the game with them. And a new player wouldn't know much about this at this point in time. It's still fine because you're in full control of your character and your pawn, able to change vocations with a quick teleport to the main city, and this creates an environment that favors experimentation and having fun. After you create your pawn and you head to sleep, you'll then face the Hydra and after cutting off one of its heads, you will be asked to head to the capital, Grand Soren. Of course, that's if you want to. In reality, the back end of Dragon's Dogma works through a series of acts. Crossing from one act to another can close off quests restricted to that act, and some quest chains are dependent, although nothing to really worry about. While some of the side quests have bigger consequences, like Madeleine, which you meet here at the encampment opening her shop, Others really don't have much of an impact, even if they are fun stories to explore with interesting lore to flesh out the world, and Dragon's Dogma is heavily skewed towards replaying it in New Game Plus and Hard Mode, so it's not that big of a concern. The playthrough I gave up on six years ago was a 100% run, and while I didn't record gameplay back then, I still remember some of them enough to not worry about them, and just enough to remember some of the more important ones. So before heading for Grand Soren, I decided to do a couple of extra quests. I explored through the Witchwood, just to remember that I couldn't do the Witch's questline with Adaro having tragically fallen off a cliff. That clumsy Adaro, those cliffs can be treacherous. I also went down the well just to face down a large group of Saurians, which are the lizard people, and they were really strong, so I had to cheese them. And then I headed towards the Notice Board, which fills out with different quests of the slay 20 goblins or hunt 15 squirrels type, which are always a good source of XP and gold. I had a decently fun time, but some issues immediately started to pop up. Firstly, this open world is very limited and highly repetitive. 
The areas available to you here at the start are few, and they are very much hallways. While that continues throughout the whole game, they're considerably more open later, so these are here at the start just linear areas that are continuously repopulated with these same enemies. There's a few extra paths that lead to other things, but they are just that. Paths. Clearly visible, and once you get on them, very little exists to make you stray from them, and that is when you rarely can actually stray from them. Traversal of this world is slow. Weight has a huge impact on your movement speed. The difference between being within average weight and lightweight can be immediately felt, and especially early on, your very limited stamina and slow recovery time for it means that sprinting is not something you do very often. This combination, while later we'll see how it improves, creates a very tedious system that I think could be a harsh stopping point for many people. You will slowly trek the same open air hallway, be interrupted by the same enemies, which at this point are either very easy or way too strong, and you'll move towards an area just to find out there's nothing there or that you'd get destroyed for trying. The only area you can head to, the bandit camp in Witchwood, are a fair bit too difficult, and this is how the game informs you that you should probably head to Grand Soren. but it takes a while of slowly walking around and getting beat into the dirt to discover that, unless you have some prior knowledge. One of the other points of contention is the save system. You have one save, the game auto-saves, but not very often. You can head into an area, slog through a battle you're not ready for, win, and if you forget to save and get mauled by something else a few meters away, you will retry a fair bit before that initial battle. When you compare it to some other games with almost unlimited saves and multiple constant auto-saves, it's definitely something that can turn people away with just one bad experience. After exploring a bit, I decide to depart for Grand Soren with the infamous cart. If there's a quest people remember, it's this one. A slow escort quest where you must protect the cart carrying the Hydra's head to present in Grand Soren along with the Arisen. This is a slow trek through the mountains that depending on your party composition can be a fair bit annoying with all the flying enemies, and you stop on occasion, open some gates, fight some enemies, and very slowly wait as the cart heads to Grand Soren, although there are ways of entertaining yourself while you wait. And once you reach the capital, you also reach the hub for the rest of the game. The capital itself, for the time, is a big dense area. There's plenty of buildings and rooftops, NPCs with quests and little nooks and crannies to explore. It reminds me a bit of how Kingdom Hearts has its own approach to town and exploration within them. It has everything you need, with your typical inn where you can rest, manage your storage, inventory, and change vocations as well as set up your skills. It's very convenient in how the inn is next to the blacksmith for upgrading weapons and next to the apothecary for healing items, meaning most of the important things you need are close together. Further from the town square is the Black Cat, a specialty shop that sells expensive special items and higher level gear, as well as the ability to make forgeries. And then there's Madeleine's shop, the barber, and the slums. The rest of the city contains the Pawns Guild and the Noble Corridor, where later you get access to the Duke's Domain. Grand Soren won't win any awards, but boy does it really try to. It has a charm and personality to it, and as you quickly learn its layout, if you're like me, you'll learn to love it. The next big quest has you meeting Barnaby at the Pawns Guild and heading down into the Everfall to obtain a port crystal. And this is your first real dungeon experience. It's the first proper longer one at least, and you'll face down some more difficult enemies as you head downwards into it. Maybe get some extra loot and then get invaded by tentacles when now you have to make a run for it. Here, if you're playing Dark Arisen, you will get the Eternal Fairy Stone, and this significantly helps with the pacing and tedious travel. The Port Crystal you picked up is an item that you can put down anywhere that is part of the open world map, let's call it that. You can't do it inside dungeons or cities. And with the Fairy Stone, you can teleport to that location. You can also pick up the Port Crystal and set it down anywhere else, and eventually, you'll have quite a few port crystals all over the map. 
Originally, these fairy stones were a consumable that you had to find or spend a bit of coin on, and while you can tell that it wasn't designed with the eternal fairy stone in mind, especially obvious in small quirks like not being able to teleport from the map screen, you have to manually open your inventory and use the item, there is a reason that the Eternal One is here in the quote-unquote revised version of the game, and that's because the game flows much better with it. With your home base established, the next chapter of the story unfolds, and the game quickly starts to take shape and begins to show its cards. It does this, for my tastes, far too late. But what awaits is truly enjoyable. For starters, a mysterious plot must be uncovered, as there seems to be traitors within the nation and its military. You shadow a knight who meets with Madeleine in her shop and you begin the plot of salvation, a cult that reveres the dragon and wants to destroy the world. They're not particularly deep nor subtle, but hey, you need some sort of conflict, I suppose. Here you are also introduced to the worm hunt and in general, the main quests. Quests can broadly be divided in three parts. You have main quests which must be completed, or at least a number of them, before you can progress the story. Then you have side quests, which are more involved and with actual goals, and then generated quests, which Elder Scrolls would call radiant quests where you simply escort someone or kill X amount of things, just general busy work. As you might expect, the main quests are the biggest ones, and they get quite complex fairly quickly, and that leads to some really cool situations. At this point, you have two main ones, a big siege, and to investigate a cult meeting in the catacombs. By now, your pawns might be low level, because only you and your main pawn, the one that you design, gain levels. So you'll find yourself switching out pawns regularly. And mentioning that gives me an excuse to talk about progression in the game. As I said before, you level up and gain stats, as well as leveling your vocation to gain access to better skills, but a large part of your power comes from gear. There's nothing randomized except for some post-game accessories, but there's a large list of different weapons and armor, and either finding or buying a new weapon and enhancing it using monster parts will give you a significant edge in combat. While Dragon's Dogma isn't really a hard game per se, since you always have a way of stockpiling healing and stamina for you and your pawns and brute forcing a fight, it is a game that can brick wall you. If you don't have the damage for something, you aren't capable of exploiting an enemy's weakness or something similar, you will feel like you do no damage, and fights can extend for an ungodly amount of time. This means that sometimes the best answer is a little bit of grinding and shopping to keep you on par with the opposition, but it also means that going out to fight some more difficult enemies and grind up can be very rewarding in levels and potential loot or enhancement materials, which does incentivize you to stop along the path and smell the roses, looking to explore anything that might catch your eye out in the world. There's not that many things that will catch your eye or things to explore, but you can do them. We'll talk about this later. For now, if you're heading towards the siege, you could walk all the way around to the location, or you could make your way to the ancient quarry, which lets you cut through a mountain as long as you clear this dungeon. At the entrance of the quarry, there's a guy asking you to clear it and open the gates to allow for travel. And you can head in to experience what Dragon's Dogma does best. Dungeons. Depending on your level, gear, and pawns, this dungeon might run you anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 or 40, since there's a couple of ogres to take down and those fights can be long and grueling, but not in a bad way. And I've saved speaking about combat until now because I believe it works best in concert with that dungeon delving. Surprisingly, the dungeon delving reminds me much more of early From Software games than it does something like Bethesda Game Studios games, for example. If you're unfamiliar with Kingsfield and Shadow Tower, well, they're first-person dungeon crawlers with a very ominous and oppressive atmosphere. They themselves were inspired by things like Dungeons and & Dragons and Ultima Underworld, and there's a flow to how these dungeons present their dangers in each room, and how they ask you to be prepared with all sorts of healing items for different status effects and buffs, or even the pace at which you cast spells or buffs, or how the stamina system itself works that really sells a more old-school feel where the game asks for preparation as well as good execution of a solid plan. And just as in D&D or Kingsfield, it becomes the most fun when the plan fails and you must improvise your way through it. 
to the point where failure motivates you to try all over again instead of having you quitting the game. Your general movement and mobility is always sufficient, with ways to expand the exploration with things like double jumps or levitation on certain vocations, allowing for more exploration and hidden secrets, but where everything really shines is how combat plays out. The organized chaos of your full party and their AI feeds directly into that improvisational aspect of the game, but the long pacing of fights and the precise controls are what really hammers it home. There's no lock-on, although there is targeting for spells. There are staggers and knockdown effects with stats attached to them, and there's enemies that have mechanics from enrages to damage checks and stagger checks. You're rewarded for understanding your opponent and what they might do and how to counter it, as well as rewarded for using your environment to your advantage, be that sightlines, elevation, or even explosive barrels. The length of the fights and how nerve-wracking they can be as you find yourself forced to use stamina to dodge out of the way of attacks just for the enemy to be knocked down immediately after, but now you don't have any stamina to take advantage of it, or how you try and save resources hoping your mage can cast a healing spell before you get hit again after you were just knocked down. None of this ever gets old, and different combinations of monsters with different elemental affinities or different spells shake up every encounter significantly, even if later on some of those combinations looking to be as difficult as possible can be infuriating, but it doesn't take away just how good the combat is and how the combination of vocations, gear, upgrades, skills, party composition, and enemies leads to every skill, every hit, being a satisfying experience as you take off chunks of enemies' HP and pull off cool feats that border on emergent gameplay. After clearing out the quarry, you reach some woods leading to a fortress filled with goblins and cyclops, which you must infiltrate through tunnels into a large battlefield where ballista fire covers the arena, and you must navigate your way to take out all the enemies and reach the enemy leader. This is another aspect of Dragon's Dogma that I love, since it leaves you to your own devices on either luring enemies into smaller rooms or trying to use the ballista in combat or going for an all-out Lord of the Rings-style brawl. You can also simply let Sir Robert, which is part of the quest, to die, either before the siege or during the siege once you open the doors for him and his team, or you can actually complete the task and protect Sir Robert and then go back to complete the quest. It's properly epic, and really shows how the scale of the game can be much larger than what you imagined even after seeing the Hydra fight or maybe a spare griffin around the fields. The next quest has you infiltrating the catacombs with some more traditional dungeon diving, as in literally you're diving into catacombs. Skeletons and zombies all litter the halls along with other enemies and some loot opportunities as you make your way to the secret meeting. We'll check up on the cult leader, but for now the next main quest requires you to travel north to Hill Figure Knoll next to Windbluff Tower, where you will meet an Arisen. Yes, there are more Arisen than just you, and these have also lost their hearts to the dragon, which is known as Grigory. And after explaining more about this world, you complete this quest, originally about translating a text, and then you make your way to the fourth quest in this chapter. The Water God's Altar takes you to a waterfall near the starting city of Casardis where you can enter a dungeon with a very unique design within the game. There's water below, and water in this world calls forth the brine, an evil smoke that will damage you and teleport you back to the most recent solid land, because at its heart, this brine is a really good guy. And so you must navigate and defeat different enemies as you make your way to the heart of the cave and find a way to lower the water level. From there, you must collect a series of slabs to bring back to a researcher working for the Duke. Every one of these dungeons that you encounter in this chapter are fun, unique, and show off the best of the game. Although there's other quests that you can embark on during the same chapter, some of which can become locked if you ignore them here, and others that wouldn't be affected, and they range from taking out bandits for a different group of bandits, which can then help you later, to escort missions or helping out some more with cult investigations. You can take those on or leave them, but once you finish the main missions, you will move on, and whatever quest can't proceed past that breaking point will be left behind. 
But with the completion of the quests, you'll be allowed within the Duke's domain. The palace, if you will, where the Duke and the court convene, and you will be introduced to a host of new characters, from Alinor, the Duke's new wife, to Aldus, your new main quest giver, and a whole host of other figures. This is probably the part of the game with the longest list of side quests available, from conspiracies to be resolved at night in the Duke's gardens, along side quests regarding witches, including Selene, who instead of an Arisen is actually a former pawn, or freeing a captive man from the dungeons. You will deal with thieves, infiltrate the cult, and more. And one of my favorites of all of these options is the conspiracy one with Fettel. He claims that a confidential letter explaining treason has been lost and you must retrieve it, and he will reward you for doing so. To do this, you head to Soul Flayer Canyon, which is my favorite dungeon in the base game. A large, well, canyon, with a varied list of enemies from undead to harpies and gargoyles, as well as a dangerous fight with a cyclops where falling off can be the end of you. This location leads to you sliding down slopes where you can get off at different areas during that slide for different loot, and it's just a pleasure to navigate in its scale especially as you look up, down, or across and can frequently be impressed at the size of this place. When it comes to Aldus and his main quests, you will have to hunt down a griffin, which leads you all the way to Blue Moon Tower in a trek through a windy valley where the wind keeps pushing you back and you must face bandits and golems to reach the destination, ending with a grand chase and a confrontation with that griffin. The rock valley itself is littered with little caves and ambush spots that lead to a fun and engaging walk through it, and if you count it as part of the quest, it's a fairly long one with plenty to see and do. But this is where previous knowledge of the game can greatly matter, and where some of my concerns come through. You see, later on you will need to return to Blue Moon Tower. It's not particularly changed, it's just a reuse of this big location, but it is the very corner of the map that requires the same perilous trek to return to. And if you know this, you can set down a port crystal that bypasses that very long trek entirely. But if you don't, you have to do the whole trek again, just to clear out the same dungeon again. It really shows where some of the game has been cut or other things have been padded or reinserted into what they had available. And none of that does the game any favors. It's actually pretty balanced around this and you'll find yourself slightly underleveled if you don't end up repeating some of these larger segments of walking throughout the open world but there's a ton of ways to gain levels elsewhere or compensate with loot, especially with the quality of life improvements and gear from the Dark Arisen expansion. There is a different defense that can be made for this though, and that is that those long treks and exploration are a main part of the game. It was designed with limited fast travel and without knowledge of the future on your first playthrough, but it doesn't matter how you try to spin that. The fact is that repeating the same long road with the same tedious running and stamina management can be exciting on a first go but not on a second one, when nothing else has changed about it. At most, you'll simply be more powerful, and what used to be a potentially tense encounter and interesting new locations to explore en route to your objective are now trivially easy encounters and an area you've already seen. These are the shortcomings that stand out in the original release in reception to the game. It's overly long early game without the in-depth vocation mechanics and skills, devoid of the interesting locales and dungeons, and then all the amazing things that start appearing later on can still be marred by these limitations, faults in its design and repetition. So let's take a trip down memory lane for just a second. Dragon's Dogma was constantly compared to Skyrim and frequently sold as Dark Souls meets Skyrim, and its repetitive, often empty and monotonous open world was compared unfavorably to Skyrim, while the dungeon delving was often compared also unfavorably to Dark Souls. This is because Skyrim was all the rage at the time, and Dark Souls was the big surprise hit. As much as similarities can be seen between these games, they're only superficially true, and it's worth mentioning that Dragon's Dogma was in development long before we knew anything about Skyrim or about Dark Souls. Taken at its face, the open world of Dragon's Dogma is considerably worse in many ways compared to Skyrim. 
while its level and dungeon design, in my opinion, is leagues ahead. And Dark Souls combat and dungeon design aren't really better or worse, they're just very different. While they both share a lot of things, from punishing animation-locked combat, stamina meters, and that western dark fantasy vibe going on, all of those things are also true of Capcom's flagship franchise of Monster Hunter, where party mechanics are important, much like in Dragon's Dogma, won't you look at that? And if you take the open world and basically fold it into each quest, think framing it like a level, like you talk to someone and they tell you, go down this road to this place, instead of framing it as an open world in itself, then it would be a level-based RPG-style version of Monster Hunter, which I am aware that Monster Hunter is very much an RPG anyways. What I'm saying is, there's no denying the open world here is uninteresting and lacks real motivation for exploration. Especially once you see that if there's something interesting to explore, the game will find a reason to send you there through some quest or another. But what it lacks in grand vision and exploration, it makes up for in its more focused goal of providing that Dungeons & Dragons party-faring adventure accompanied by the combat. Like most D&D sessions, it's at its best when you have a clear goal of where to head. You prepare for the journey and go complete your adventure, following the best laid plans of the DM. And when you randomly ask, hey, what's, what's to the west? Is there anything over to the west? And the DM replies, you spot a rock formation. And then you just waste time going there as the Dungeon Master either struggles to or is frustrated by your obsession with some rocks instead of all the great plans that they had in mind. So in the other words of Frank Sinatra, in other other words, a game like Skyrim is a game where the world is created and then a player is put into it. In Dragon's Dogma, they made quests and locations and then they found a way to connect them with no real extra thought or design to those connecting pieces, but with plenty of thought and design to everything that was considered. And a great example of this is Trials and Tribulations. This is a main quest where a trial is set up for the corruption of the local rich merchant, Fornival. He's accused of taking advantage of people and basically being a greedy bastard, which if you've done previous side quests around town, like dealing with a situation where he is trying to evict some tenants, you might have an opinion on. Interestingly enough, there's plenty of evidence to be found on both sides. Now, I'm not claiming Dragon's Dogma is impeccably written or that the characters are marvelously executed, but they use basic tropes to create very compelling characters within their limitations. People praise Fornival's dedication to helping the town or in helping those in need with military efforts or the church, while others do speak on how he is a greedy bastard. You can collect evidence on either side to save him or convict him, and losing him also means losing an important merchant, so you might be incentivized to save him. You present your evidence to Aldous, and after four days, judgment is passed. This time around, I presented three pieces of evidence to save Fornival, and he got convicted, so that's interesting, I guess. The final main quest in this chapter is Mercedes who shows up earlier in the game during your initial training and is actually an aide from a different country with a bit of a chip on her shoulder. She has something to prove as she goes to handle an uprising up north and once you arrive she will be in combat with Julian who has ties to the Salvation Cult. You can either save Mercedes or have her lose her duel. In either case, she's distraught over how she really isn't capable of doing her job and it should have been her brother to come help in Grantsas. She leaves and promises to return with help, and also, she's really cool, but that's just my opinion. As you return to Grand Sorin, you'll be sent on a wild goose chase to the Southern Way Castle, just to be called back to the city. It turns out, it's under attack from Salvation who have summoned a cockatrice, which is basically a griffin, but it can silence you, apply petrification, and is generally much more dangerous. And after fending it off, the last part of the game will commence. It's worth mentioning that if you accept that previous quest and didn't prepare for the difficulty spike of the cockatrice, you're kind of cockatrice out of luck. Because with the city closed off, you can't really gear up, change vocations, or skills until after the fight in the city. And it's 
Those small inconveniences that can consistently make a player mad at this game, no matter how great it can be. Here you can also engage with the ending to Madeline's quests, and also the Duchess Eleanor, and this matters because you'll have to choose who your beloved is, which is determined by how much affinity you have with them. Oh yeah, this game has an affinity system and technically romance. I ignored Madeline and Eleanor because they both kind of suck in my opinion, but if you cared, here's where their quests end because after this, everything changes. Upon fending off the cockatrice, the duke will reward you with different gear, except one chest that requires the Worm King's ring, which, oh I forgot, yeah, there's a quest to recover this ring from an evil sorcerer and deliver it to the duke, but I just forged a copy so I could keep the ring, since it's pretty useful for sorcerers, but there's a price to pay for forging it, and even this tiny little cutscene that plays where the king assumes that something might be malfunctioning with the ring because he can't use it to open the chest. It's this sort of details that are just all over this game and frequently make you go, damn, this game is awesome. But after this, it's time to head to the corner of the map in one last trek towards the Great Wall to face Grigory. This is one final dungeon, and it's actually where the tutorial took place, and after many encounters, you will reach Grigory, who has a proposal. Sacrifice your beloved to him for a moment of glory, or face him, and that's a fake ending, because if you sacrifice your beloved, you get nothing, it just forces you to reload the game. This will make sense later. In this playthrough, my beloved was Aldous. Uh, probably because I ignored everyone except Mercedes, which I thought was going to be my beloved, but somehow it's Aldous, which is ridiculous, but sure. And now you face the dragon. This fight includes this cool Crash Bandicoot moment as you run away, and then a very dramatic flight as you hold on to Grigory. And finally, you face him and kill him. He has plenty to say, there's plenty of exposition, but it mostly boils down to the roles of the Arisen and the dragon and society, and free will and volition, and we'll talk about story later. For now, the dragon is slain. A cutscene plays showing you what happens to the world, and although the credits might roll, the game is far from done. You wake up in your house in Casardus, along with the beloved you save. Come here, Aldous. This is my hometown. Come with me. Be careful, though. The cliffs are treacherous. From here, the world has fallen into whatever you want to call the sickly green sky and destruction, thanks to the dragon's curse with his final breath. As you head back to Grand Sorin, you're meant to go see the Duke, who has now aged and also wants to kill you. You see, he was once an Arisen, but he took the dragon's deal. That's why he's on his second wife. But without the dragon, the deals made to hold things together vanished, meaning that he has also turned into this weak old man. No longer an Arisen. After dueling him, he will call you a traitor and twist the situation to have you hunted within the Noble Corridor, and the post-game starts to reveal itself. And that is the Everfall, which is now properly an Everfall. And you can head down, and your new objective becomes to collect 20 Wake Stones, commonly farmed in the Everfall, in order to continue. This place of Everfalling itself is a series of rooms with different encounters and loot and semi-randomized layouts as different doors might be open or closed on each platform upon your return. And here you get to fight new enemies, new configurations of them, and just much stronger enemies in general. It's nice to have something to farm and grind, but it's not the most engaging loop, since combat is the star, but not really exploration nor navigation. It's just a nice final grind. Unless you're playing Dark Arisen, because you might be farming a bit before you enter Bitter Black Isle. You can technically travel here all the way from the start of the game, but it's not really recommended. Bitter Black Isle is the expansion content, which brings with it a much more engaging endgame in what I personally consider to be not only one of the best expansions ever made, but the best part of Dragon's Dogma overall. Traveling to this island begins the story of Orla and Daemon. As you scour this terrible place in search of the truth that hides beneath the surface, and its ties to pawns, the arisen, and the ways of this world. It's basically one huge dungeon, with a series of branching paths that take you back to the start in Metroidvania-style shortcuts, or if you prefer, alternate starts in a roguelike. You're meant to make your way down the aisle, towards the final boss, solving each area as a dungeon and collecting loot. Most of it, new and more powerful than what could be obtained before. 
The best loot is dropped Corrupted, and it requires Rift Crystals, a currency previously only useful for hiring pawns, but that here is used to purify these Corrupted drops so that you can find out what they are. And enemies on the Isle drop Rift Crystals all the time. This new gear chase, along with the new location, new enemies, and how much it requires powering up to overcome, means that the loop of the DLC refreshes everything I think is strong from the base game, but focuses it down by getting rid of the open world. Sure, we miss quests and characters, which I think some people might expect in a proper expansion, but what it decides with this is to declare that the best it can offer as an endgame is this focus, and I believe they're right. The fact that the gear and armor you obtain is random also incentivizes having all your vocations leveled and geared, meaning that there's an even bigger grind for those looking for it. And on top of this, there are new rings, which can improve your skills, unlocking even stronger versions of them that can dramatically power up your character. And since they go beyond stats, they feel very rewarding as drops. I think tying these more powerful skills to random loot can make it frustrating to go for a specific build, but it is also in keeping with this vision of having major endgame grind vibes. Bitter Black Isle offers the most intricate level design in the game, with plenty of hidden passageways, alternate routes, varied arenas to fight in, and an assortment of new monsters as well. From the Gore Cyclops to the enormous Gazer, different dragons, worms, and wyverns, and to top it all off, Damon, who waits at the bottom of everything. Damon himself really hits somewhere between a monster hunter late game monster and a Dark Souls boss in his design and aggression, having many more moves and mobility, making him a test of skill. Unless you've grinded a lot. Really, Bitter Black Isle brings to the forefront a problem that's present throughout the whole game. Stats and gear really remove a lot of the engagement of Dragon's Dogma, but skill really doesn't compensate for it. Yes, if you have the perfect party and skills, even underleveled and undergeared, you can take out stuff that you shouldn't be able to, but it just becomes a very long and costly encounter. When you're overgeared and overleveled, then you don't really take damage and you deal damage even without exploiting weaknesses. And this isn't the worst thing ever, it's quite common to have this division when playing a game that doesn't scale stuff to suit you. It's the price you pay for freedom which allows you to blast through low-level enemies and helps you feel powerful, and the ability to go smack high-level monsters and feel good about it if you wanted that challenge. But especially in Bitter Black Isle, they really tested some more interesting ways around this that I personally enjoy when I know many people hate them. You remember how I mentioned Shadow Tower in Kingsfield a while before? Which I don't know if I'll ever talk about Kingsfield on the channel, but you do have my deep dive into Shadow Tower and Shadow Tower Abyss in case you want to watch those. Well, those games very often felt like they combined puzzle solving into their dungeoneering, overcoming status effects or unique gimmicks, and having to leave and prepare for the weakness of a specific monster. You know, cool stuff that has now disappeared because I guess it's frustrating to people or something. And not only is that kind of present throughout the base game of Dragon's Dogma, but more so on the Isle. Stuff like the Cockatrice's Petrification had me going for a Sorcerer Pawn with High Void spell to cancel it, or amassing different healing items. On the Isle, curses as well as being drenched is a big issue in many fights, or fighting the giant eyeball requires you to position below so that it can harm itself, and is also accompanied by a DPS check. There's enemies like the living armor that is basically immune to magic, and that at this point in my playthrough where I had officially become a magic archer completely halted my playthrough until I used gravity against it. The cliffs are treacherous, please be careful. And Damon is really the only one that doesn't have this more puzzle-like element to it. He has a stagger check, but that's really it. And aside from him, there's a ton of small details around the aisle, from throwing enemies off cliffs, to lanterns that you can activate to deal damage, just all sorts of things. And they indicated a trend towards a design that I think is a useful tool in the imbalance with levels and gear, and it's that puzzle-like design. This is one of the reasons I love Bitter Black Isle so much, and I'm kind of confused as to why Damon doesn't follow that same philosophy. 
either if it was on purpose or if maybe he was one of the starting points in the design of the DLC and he got kind of left back as the rest was designed over him. Another reason that I love Bitter Black Isle is how hard it goes on lore, with you collecting messages left by previous Arisen who were on the Isle, and the grand reveal that Damon is not actually Damon, he's Ash. And who is Ash, you ask? Well, we need to start a bit before, because Ulra is Gret's pawn, and now I know you're confused. Ulra is the character that stands at the entrance to the Isle, offering services and narrating the backstory for you. And Gret was an Arisen. They both together as Arisen and Pawn found friendship in a young man named Ash, and Gret became a mentor to this young man, almost like a mother figure in his life. And when Gret and Ulra faced the dragon, Ulra returned, but Gret did not. Ash then became older, and his relationship with Ulra matured. Ulra, who slowly started to resemble her master Gret more and more. Over time, Ash and Ulra fell in love, but as fate would have it, very appropriate by the way, the dragon chose Ash to be an Arisen, and Ash chose Ulra as his pawn. When they faced the dragon, it offered the deal it always does, a moment of glory for your beloved's life. But Ash's beloved was Ulra, and get this, the dragon isn't just Grigory, this dragon was Gret. And so, Ash had to choose between sacrificing his love, Ulra, or killing his mentor, Gret. And Ash refused both, cursing all and wishing for power, the power to break the cycle. And now you might be asking, what cycle are you talking about, Mug? And don't worry, this is the story portion of the video. As I said, the concepts of Dragon's Dogma are much better than the story itself, but let's get into it. Arisens and Dragons are part of a cycle. Dragons make Arisens, and Arisens make pawns, and they try to take on the dragon, but there's a missing piece we'll get to in a moment. Pawns themselves are beings of no free will, a shadow to serve in the Arisen's light, but they also become more through their interactions with the Arisen. They're more than husks, even if they lack that free will, at least initially. And the themes of free will and doing things of your own volition is a common theme throughout Dragon's Dogma. But what happens when an Arisen defeats Grigory? How is there a cycle? I thought the dragon was gone and the sky had turned green and everything sucked. Well, those who defeat Grigory are destined to meet the Seneschal, an ascended Arisen pretty much a god of the world. They must face the Seneschal, and if the Arisen is defeated by them, they will become the next Grigory. If they defeat the Seneschal, they become the new Seneschal, to begin the cycle anew, conjuring up a new dragon that will create new Arisens, that could maybe one day become the next Seneschal. The Dragonforge so long ago, a former Arisen, who was now hiding, was one that either took the deal or lost in their fight against Grigory, but decided to flee. And since Arisen don't age, he simply exists. The Duke took the deal, and as you can see, there can be many Arisen, there can be many pawns that even live on beyond their Arisen's demise. And once Grigory is defeated, the Arisen and the magics he struck on the world disappear. The Dragonforged, old as he was, becomes dust. The Duke suddenly ages, and this dragon that we fight in the game comes after Savan, the character we played in the prologue, who is revealed to be the current Seneschal, and he's been around for a while. When you finish collecting wake stones in the Everfall, you face Savan, and you defeat them, and they explain to you the ways of the world. You are now the Seneschal, you can't do anything. You can observe the world in Casardis or in Grand Soren, and everything has been restored, but you can't play the game anymore. You're invisible. You can't do anything or explore or fight. And at this point, you either are here waiting until the next Arisen defeats Grigory to face you, or you take your own life. 
and break the cycle. But when you take your life, you fall, and who you are is merged into your pawn, who is now awakened and ready to take on a new cycle. And that new cycle here is just New Game Plus. The cycle can't be broken, even when the Seneschal takes his own life. This world isn't bound by dogma, it's bound by rules. So how do the specifics work? Well, that's a bit more fuzzy. Ulra took on her Arisen's likeness despite her Arisen becoming Seneschal without her, so maybe all pawns become their Arisen's regardless? She awakened with her Arisen still as Seneschal, which we would assume can't happen unless the Seneschal takes their own life or something, or is defeated, I guess, but that wasn't the case. Damon, or Ash rather, didn't break the cycle, but he did escape it and do something completely different and morph into a dragon. There's a ton of small questions and plot holes to dig into, although not as many as you might think. There's quite a bit of lore. But the whole thing about being the one to break the cycle really didn't help Dragon's Dogma's cause in escaping the Dark Souls comparisons, by the way. In any case, at this point, you can start New Game Plus. You can play in hard mode. You can do your journey again. And I didn't even mention the second trip into Bitter Black Isle, since after defeating Daemon, something that is designed to be done around level 100 is simply the first time around. It's designed for you to do it all over again, with new, harder enemy layouts as you try and defeat the awakened dragon form of Daemon at the bottom. But I didn't do that, mostly because I didn't feel like it. So here's some of that fight from a YouTube video. To be honest, for me, after 90 hours, Dragon's Dogma was enough on this fourth trip through it. I still loved it, even when I hated it, but that was my stopping point. I didn't mention it before, but the game also crashed on me around 120 times, I'm not exaggerating. At almost any transition screen in the game, it could crash, and nothing I tried to do seemed to solve it, which made me get angrier even faster, as I had to continuously repeat content until I learned to save about every two minutes. So I just didn't want to do much more, but it did leave me with a great appreciation for the game and its context. In the last six years, I have changed as a person, and in the last year, I started putting pen to paper when analyzing games, their systems, mechanics, designs, and intentions, and really putting effort into the study of the things I love, and doing this sort of thing for different RPGs like that old FromSoft catalog or some other older RPGs for a potential massive retrospective coming soon. And all of this has helped me better understand the game I really enjoyed that I now love and that I deeply appreciate beyond simply playing it, but for what it represents within games and its genre. Dragon's Dogma might be flawed, it might even be broken, but its strengths aren't quite what was said about it at the time. It's not about it doing what it does really well or some cop-out like that. It's that it's the only one that has ever tried to do what it does, and it does it well. That uniqueness carrying legacy on its back makes it all the more important to remember and experience. There are many games I compare in my mind with Dragon's Dogma, and there are things like Ultima and Kingsfield and Monster Hunter and Nier. None of them are things I see enough of, and that's a torch worth not just bearing, but worth playing and preserving. And so we reach the conclusion of this first chapter of a three-part series. All of my longer videos are in my long form analysis playlist if you want more. And if you want to see my deep dives into Dragon's Dogma 2 and the breakdown between them and their places in time in their genre, subscribe for those videos coming really soon. Along with some much more frequent videos, I normally upload three to four times per week as I cover stuff in games when I don't get wrapped up in a huge project like this one at least. Thank you very much for watching. If you made it all the way to the end and you like the video, make sure to hit the like button and leave a comment below and sneak in the word beloved and I'll make sure to heart every single person that does that. Or you can make a joke about cliffs, that's also worthwhile too. And as always, I will see you again very soon.